Hilas mori Hello and welcome to Islam in the Middle Ages, a series for IHSHG, examining the Islamic world from Muhammad's to the Mughal Empire, on the first Sunday of each month. In the last episode, we saw the meteoric rise of the early Islamic Caliphate, and the factors that allowed a niche, new religion to become one of the most influential forces in global medieval history. We saw the world before the Prophet Muhammad, his ministry and early following, the rise of the new power, and the devastating civil war that created the Sunni-Shia divide. Today, we pick up where we left off, examining the dynasty that the victor of the first Fitna, the governor of Syria, Muawiyah, established, and the unique legacy it left to the Islamic world thereafter. This podcast wouldn't be possible without the support of the IHSHG, and I would like to thank them for giving me the platform to be able to host this. Do be sure to check out their website, Facebook page, and YouTube channels for more historical discussions in English and Portuguese. So, let's begin. Muawiyah, following his victory over Ali at Sifin, became the first and founding member of a dynasty of caliphs known as the Umayyads. Named after the Banu Umayyad tribe of which Mu'awiyah was a member, this was a dynastic polity by which the caliph's son succeeded him upon his death, and power was, for the most part, consolidated within the caliph's family. For reference, this dynasty is often differentiated from the first four caliphs that succeeded Muhammad, known later as the Rashdun, or rightly guided caliphs, so called as they would go on to be seen as the only four caliphs that could be written about without any substantial deal of controversy or political intrigue within the non-Shia Islamic world. Indeed, it should be noted that establishing a dynasty in the way that the Umayyads did was regarded as a highly controversial act. As you'll hopefully remember from the last episode, when the position of caliph was established, there was a great deal of uncertainty around the qualifications for office and the extent of the caliph's power. And in this period, that doubt still, to some extent, lingered. Later sources, however, would discuss the Umayyads in a scathing light, claiming that they were abusing the office of caliph to promulgate their personal political ambitions, instead of acting as figureheads from which the whole Islamic world could be united. It is this latter idea that would later come to articulate the kind of person that the caliph ought to be in the high politics of the Islamic world. And this development was, I argue, largely shaped by the experience of Umayyad government in the late 7th and early 8th centuries. We must, as always, be careful of the written accounts from this period, given that many come from the Abbasid Caliphate that would later overthrow and replace Umayyad rule over the Islamic world. Like many successor dynasties, the Abbasids went to some lengths to denigrate the power that had come before them, so it's likely that their vices are exaggerated in our sort of material. It's worth mentioning too that the Abbasids were in many ways just as dynastic and politically partisan as their predecessors, as we will see in the third episode of this podcast. Nevertheless, despite this caveat, the Umayyads continue to attract controversy, and their reputation for taking advantage of the office of the Caliphates for their own ends has persisted in the way that they're written about and spoken of today. Despite this caveat, the Umayyads continue to attract controversy, and their reputation for taking advantage of the office of the Caliphates for their own ends has persisted even today in the way that they're discussed and written about. Following his victory over the armies of Ali, Mu'awiyah rose to power as Khalif in 661, establishing a new capital from the Caliphate in Damascus, in his home province of Syria. His style of rule was similar to that of the methods he deployed in his previous position as governor of this region, that is to say, ruling primarily 
through a network of trading alliances formed of the prominent groups of Syria at the time. A number of innovations, however, were introduced by this new khalif. The bands of tribes that had formed the bulk of the caliphal armed force was replaced by a salaried standing army garrisoned in Syria, and a formal circle of elites was established amongst the leaders of the conquering armies, who would go on to administer the cities of the new caliphate. As a result of these reforms, by the end of his caliphal rule in 680, a status quo of power had emerged in the Islamic world. The caliphate was a primarily urban power, boasting a chain of sophisticated cities that were rivaled in size and wealth only by Tang China. These were managed and ruled by the military leaders of early conquests, known as emirs, as well as judges of Islamic law, known as Qadis. Many of these cities, however, also regularly negotiated and worked with both rural communities and tribal groups. Lacking the infrastructure and means to exercise direct control over the rural areas around the cities, these networks were vital for bringing in the agricultural surpluses to maintain the cities of the Islamic world. As such, legal practices and customs could vary considerably, even within the boundaries of a city-state, as it was often necessary to allow rural and nomadic areas to continue with their own laws, provided, of course, they didn't clash directly with Quranic teachings and Sharia law. With regards to this law, the Umayyads set a precedent of issuing legal opinions and advising Qadis, who wrote to them with more difficult legal issues. Those familiar with the Roman system of imperial decretals, or the growth of papal canon law in the Middle Ages, may be able to draw parallels with this system as it was a fairly similar structure, whereby the Khalif would receive concerns from local rulers and respond with an interpretation that would later set a precedent as the letter was disseminated to others. This was a duty that, it would appear, most of the Khalifs of this period took very seriously. We have evidence of rulings being issued from all of the Khalifs that set precedents for legal management in this period. This is unique, as it's the only time in Islamic history that the Khalifs were able to wield power over the interpretation of Sharia as freely as this. And it must be noted that this caused some controversy amongst scholars of Islamic law, who would later believe that this freedom to interpret the decrees of God by men, no matter how well educated those men were, was a sure way to deviate from the righteous path that the Prophet allowed mankind to return to. This corpus of law, incidentally, was also beginning to become increasingly standardized and comprehensive, as the transition continued from tribal confederacies to settled empire, spurred on by the growth of Quranic studies as the cities of the Islamic world began to mature into permanent settlements that could house schools of learning known as madrasas. Sharia law is interesting in as much as it is more concerned with personal status and religious devotion than it is in matters of commerce and criminal justice. Whilst there is certainly precedent in the Quran for both of these affairs, they were in practice managed by precedents laid down by an individual Qadi's rulings, known as Ra'i, as well as the laws of communities that were able to govern themselves, such as Bedouins in the Arab Peninsula, as well as religious minorities, such as Christians and Jews. It should be noted, though, that Mu'awiyah's authority wasn't wholly accepted throughout the Islamic world. In Iraq in particular, the martyrdom of Ali had been received badly by the religious scholars there who believed that the Khalif should be chosen for their piety and skill, and not as part of a dynastic succession. Support for Shiite teaching began to grow in this region, largely as the province began to feel increasingly disconnected from the new metropole. It didn't help either that, as a result of Mu'awiyah's attempts to centralize the caliphate, Iraq in this period was ruled by a string of governors appointed from Damascus who had a reputation for heavy-handed management of the population. This only served to distance the province further from the centre of power in Syria. It also bears mention that Iraq was a wealthier and better connected region of the Caliphate than Syria in this period, and also had a stronger Islamic identity. There were more Arab settlers here, and the cities of Iraq 
didn't have the established non-Arab and non-Muslim traditions that Syrian cities such as Aleppo, Edessa, Antioch, and Damascus tended to be characterised by. Iraq, in this episode, cannot be ignored. Their wealth and resources, coupled with prominent anti-Umayyad sentiments, placed them in a prime position to be a thorn in the side of the Umayyads as their dynasty went on. Something that eventually would prove to be absolutely devastating for the Umayyads. Elsewhere too, issues began to emerge. Egypt, like Iraq, began to feel isolated from the centre of power in Damascus, and that their wealth and resources were being driven away from them. Furthermore, the family heads of Mecca and Medina also began to express resentments over Mu'awiyah's treatments of them, feeling, understandably, that they had been sidelined in the new streams of patronage despite being the leaders of the birthplace of Islam. To compound matters even further, two prominent tribes of Mu'awiyah's trading alliance, the Kolb and Qais, began to clash with each other for a greater share of the Khalif's patronage, threatening the coalition on which his power was built. More general issues were beginning to come to the fore as well. The pace of conquest was beginning to slow by the end of the 670s, to resume only at the very end of the century. Without conquest to act as a release valve for pressures within the caliphate, as well as a lucrative source of enrichment between groups on the borders of Umayyad society, tensions and resentments over Syria's domination of the other parts of the Islamic world began to surface again, without the sufficient outlet to alleviate them. Furthermore, it's also worth remembering that the caliphates had grown out of confederacies of Arab tribes with a shared faith, and many of the ways of managing a group like this had to adapt to the challenges of ruling a large, multi-ethnic empire like that of Byzantium and Persia. This new style of rulership demanded new methods to make it successful, and arguably, Mu'awiyah's inability to quickly adopt these changing circumstances exacerbated the breakdown of political order in the caliphate, as he tried to rule a sophisticated bureaucratic network in the same way as a tribal coalition. These tensions suddenly and dramatically came to the fore in 680, with the death of Mu'awiyah and the succession of his son as Yazid I, the second Umayyad Khalif. In Iraq, Ali's son El Hussein rose in rebellion against the Umayyads, only to be killed in Karbala, where the Umayyads sent their Syrian army against him. El Hussein's death sparked an enormous backlash from the Shia community, who hailed, and still do revere today, El Hussein as a martyr, and began to see the caliphate as inherently hostile to Shiism, and determined to stop it at all costs. Even amongst non-Shia Muslims, the notion of a descendant of the Prophet himself being killed by a brother Muslim didn't sit easily. In addition to this, further local breakouts occurred in Medina from 683 to 692, and in Kufa in central Iraq from 685 to 7, during which time the city became effectively ungovernable. In addition to this, the Kolb and Qais tribes came to blows from 684 to 685, killing Yazid's successor Marwan I when he tried to quell them. This dramatic string of uprisings has come to be known as the Second Fitna, a grim reference to the devastating First War of just a few decades prior. The man to eventually end the conflict was Abd al-Malik I. Coming to the caliphal throne in 685, he would take the first seven years of his reign campaigning against the various dissident elements of the Islamic world to bring them to order, eventually quelling the Second Fitna by the 690s. The new Khalif realised too that a change in the political order was necessary to ensure that these kinds of conflicts and uprisings would remain isolated incidents in the Islamic world. He set up close control over the two rebellious provinces of Egypt and Iraq by installing highly loyal governors from his own family, men who, as we are duly informed, were effective at their work but isolated a lot of minority groups during their heavy-handed rule. Abd al-Malik also redistributed patronage networks too, to balance the Kolb and Qais tribes' rivalry. Conquests continued too. From the 690s onwards, 
raids into North Africa took place from the garrison city of Kairouan in modern Tunisia, one of the most eminent cities in the Western Caliphate, until the growth of Cordoba in Al Andalus. By 698, the armies of the Caliphate had conquered an area as far as modern Algeria, incorporating many Berber tribes into the fold of Islam. In 711, the Berber general Tariq ibn Ziyad went one step further, incorporating Morocco and Iberia into the Caliphate. This secondary force got as far as the Pyrenees, only to be checked by the Frankish Prince Charles Martel at the Battle of Poitiers in 732. For many scholars, this is seen as the point that Islamic conquest in the Western world stopped, and opens a fascinating counterfactual, or what if considering how things might have been different if Charles Martel hadn't repelled the conquering force. Further east, in 717, armies under Abdel Malik San Maslama marched on Constantinople and attempted, albeit unsuccessfully, to take it. From 750 onward, this feat would be attempted on an almost annual basis by subsequent caliphs. Finally, from 706 to 712, armies took over Bukhara and Samarkand in Central Asia, and marched into modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan, settling near Punjab in present-day India. In addition, Abdel Malik introduced a number of wider policies to reform the Caliphate as a whole. He implemented a standard system of weights and coinage, as well as replacing images on Islamic coins with verses from the Quran. This, incidentally, coincides with the movement amongst religious elites of the Islamic world to try to curb the use of representation of life in art, seeing it as idolatry and an attempt to replicate the divine. As a curious side note, this may well have contributed to the iconoclast controversy in the Byzantine Empire, where a comparable, although much shorter-lived purging of images on the grounds of idolatry took place. It may be argued that the circulation of Islamic coinage in Byzantine society off the back of trade that existed between the two powers despite their military enmity, led some Byzantine Christian patriarchs to consider that the success of the Islamic world was due to the fact that God favoured people who hadn't lapsed into worshipping images instead of himself. On this note of the use of images in Islamic art, however, it's worth noting that the ban was not consistently practised and many remarkable works of art with depictions of animals, plants, and even human figures exist across the medieval Islamic world. Critically, the new Khalif also set Arabic as the standard language of government administration. This was important, as it began the process by which conversing to Islam and speaking Arabic became prerequisites for those in governmental positions, as the Caliphate began to rely less and less on local administrators operating in their own languages and with their own faith and customs. I would like to take a detour to explore this further, as this is partly why the Caliphate had such a long-lasting legacy on the territories it conquered. Rather than assimilating to the culture and faith of the people they took over, the armies of Islam came with their own culture and religion, which trickled down to the conquered population from this period onward. As government started to become increasingly Arabized, many people began to convert in order to integrate into the political order. These individuals came to be known as Mawali, singular Maula, and whilst they had some restrictions on the power they wielded in some areas of the Caliphate, such as Iraq for example, they could nevertheless become very successful. Al-Andalus, or Moorish Spain, had an especially open culture of integrating Mawali into the government. This was not without some controversy, however. The question of whether Islam was for all of mankind, or just Arabs alone, was still hotly debated in this period. And whilst conversions were more common in this period, it would take up until the end of the 8th century for conversions to occur on a more widespread basis. Restrictions on other faiths began to take place as well. Churches and synagogues, for example, were not permitted to be built anew, and existing ones couldn't have spires taller than the minarets of mosques. In addition, Jews and Christians were expected to pay a fairly substantial poll tax, known as the jizya. Furthermore, proselytizing and converting away from Islam became illegal, and Jewish and Christian men were not permitted to marry Muslim women. That being said, 
it was worth bearing in mind that, in spite of these restrictions, minorities here were generally treated better than their counterparts in Christian Europe. And indeed, the coming of Islam was seen as preferable in a large number of Jewish communities, as well as Christian minority groups, who, it would seem, preferred a state that allowed them to go on relatively untroubled, versus one that took an active interest in suppressing them. In many parts of the Islamic world, such as Al-Andalus, Jews and Christians were also employed in governmental functions, and were allowed degrees of freedom to promulgate their faith. Christian bishops in Cordoba, for example, were still allowed to send missionaries to territories outside of the Caliphate's land. Returning to the subject of buildings, the increased cash flow from conquest and taxation in this period that was increasingly being sent to the Caliphal Palace in Damascus inspired an ambitious series of building projects that more confidently promulgated the message of Islam. Perhaps the most iconic example of this is the Dome of the Rock, established in 692, at the point that it was believed that the Prophet rode a winged horse to paradise at the end of his ministry. This building was most likely created as a challenge to the established faiths of the city of Jerusalem. Indeed, the calligraphy around the dome comes from a verse in the Quran calling on Christians to turn to Islam and recognize Jesus as simply a prophet of God, rather than God's human incarnation and redeemer of all humanity. Curiously, however, the glasswork in the mosque comes from the Byzantine Empire, where craftsmen in Greece and present-day Turkey were beginning to display a particular aptitude for this craft. It's one of those fascinating elements of this period, that despite being rivals with different faiths, the Islamic world and Byzantium enjoyed lively trade and cultural exchange between one another, and could be fighting one moment and supporting each other the next. It is a common misconception that Christianity and Islam were diametrically opposed to each other in the Middle Ages. The reality is a lot more nuanced, and the relationship between the two cultures, as is often the case, waxed and waned at different points. Following this, Abdel Malik's successor, Al Walid I, ruling from 705 to 715, established the Great Mosque of Medina in 710, Al Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem in 715, and the gorgeous Great Mosque of Damascus in 716. This is all evidence that wealth was being centered on Syria in this period, and stands testament to just how powerful the Khalifs have become by now. Nothing as ambitious as this was being constructed in Europe. And further west in Asia, only the ebullient Tang dynasty in China managed to rival the scale and expense of these buildings. However, these ambitious projects weren't without controversy. Some of El Walid's palaces in the Levant caused some controversy as they displayed ornate decoration of plants and animals just two decades after the ban on images was established. As a side note, this sort of decoration can also be found, curiously, in the Great Mosque of Damascus, a rare example of surviving Umayyad architectural design. Furthermore, these fed the growing accusation that the Umayyads weren't worthy commanders of the faithful at all, and were more interested in dynastic promulgation rather than leading a religious community. Nevertheless, many of these mosques survived well beyond the dynasty that created them, and stood as signs of Islam's growth and ambition during this period. Each of these mosques would have a distinct setup, but by this point, many had begun to take on. Most had a large central dome, as well as a minaret, a tower from which the azan, or call to prayer, could be called from. A large courtyard led onto the prayer hall, which contained a mihrab, a niche in the wall pointing to the direction of Mecca, as well as a minbar, a series of steps that served as a pulpit from which the imam could deliver their sermon, or khutbah, during Friday prayers. As a side note, this khutbah was an important event, because as well as teaching his congregation, an imam also customarily offered prayers for the longevity and success of the ruling khalif, as well as, on occasion, cursing his enemies. It was a mark of a khalif's legitimacy that he was prayed for during khutbahs, and imams could show their disapproval or even dissent for rule 
by praying for another individual instead. Traditionally, many mosques were decorated only in their inner space, to replicate the idea that in their walls was a small window to Jannah or paradise, and it was only in the fold of Islam that the believer would ascend. As time continued, however, external decorations also became more common. This wasn't entirely consistent, however, and some earlier mosques lacked the features that I've described as above. One especially interesting example of this is the Great Mosque of Kairawan in Tunisia, which is a rare example of a mosque before this process of standardization. I've included an image in the PowerPoint, although I encourage you to look this up for yourself, as it's a rare example of how mosques may have looked before this standard model took hold. Therefore, by the start of the 8th century, the Umayyad Khalifs were in a strong position to continue their reign. However, despite the success, a new force was beginning to emerge in the field of Islamic law that would irrevocably change where power lied in years to come. The concepts of Sunnah and Hadith. Sunnah refers to the actions and words of respectable people that are praiseworthy enough to be imitated. It was a common way to settle legal disputes and set precedents in the Arab world before the rise of Islam, to look to the Sunnah, or prominent former members of the tribe, to decide what to do. This also, incidentally, is where we get the name Sunni from, to describe Muslims that don't belong to either Shia sects or those who rejected Ali's decision at Sifin. Early on, Sunnah was used to complement teachings from the Quran, to provide a benchmark for ideal devotion whereby Muslims would imitate the deeds of especially pious early members of the community. It could also be used as a basis from which to settle legal disputes, and was also shorthand for justice and correct religious devotion. When factions fought in this period, they accused each other of going against the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Rebellions could be framed as a restoration of Sunnah from those who had perverted it. Initially, though, it didn't have any particular meaning outside of an idea of correct practice that was, usually, determined by the individual invoking it. Hadith, on the other hand, are the oral and written records of the Prophet's words and deeds, from which his own sunnah can be derived. During this period, an increasing number of Qur'anic scholars began to see hadith as a better way to set up a corpus of Islamic law, compared to the individual decisions of the khalif or qadis which were becoming increasingly indefensible as a way of interpreting God's revealed and unchanging word. As such, hadith began to spread as a second, complementary tool to the Qur'an for the purpose of establishing Islamic law and correct practice. As the Umayyad legitimacy began to waver, this idea began to gather momentum fast. Appropriate Sunnah initially referred to the actions and words of the Prophet, as well as some companions and the Rashid Khalifs, although this was eventually far down to just the Prophet, as it was felt that, as virtuous as they were, the Rashid Khalifs weren't as fully attuned to God's will as the Prophet Muhammad was. After 680, it started to become the single go-to source of law. A Qadi's individual opinion, or Ra'i, began to be intermingled with a set of legal precedents to form a more concrete form of law, without lots of subsequent innovations. From the 740s onwards, however, this began to be taken even further, and the idea developed that the Prophet's revelation and deeds were the only true windows onto God, and everything else had to be interpreted in light of the Qur'an and Hadith. As a result, this laid down a number of important precedents. Qadis and Khalifs were now no more important than any other Muslim. They were just there to uphold the law. Some scholars of this period even quipped that the grocers of Kufa had more authority than the Khalif if they had, and I quote, Hadith to go with their beans. As historian Patricia Crome puts it in her book God's Khalif, as successor of the Prophet, commander of the believers, and executor of Islamic law, he still occupied a position of central importance to the religion, but he was not authorized to define it. This, on several accounts, undermine the idea that the Khalif ought to be able to decide religious affairs on his own merit.
For one, Hadith and Sunnah were already established, and the Khalif couldn't create their own. Furthermore, it was interpreted by scholars, and not the Khalif, meaning by extension that the Khalif was no longer at liberty to set his own legal precedents. Thirdly, these two sources tended to not be reinterpreted. The original, literal interpretation always stuck, which undermined caliphal attempts to reinvigorate the principles laid down by them. From 750 onwards, this would go even further still. Instead of invoking appropriate sunnah at will, a standardized set of sunnah for each legal ruling was established, and individual qadis were required to use this instead of being able to choose at their own discretion. Although this was still in its very early stages, during the Umayyad Caliphate, this was gaining energy quickly, and would play a decisive role in the power dynamics of the Islamic world right up to the modern day. This is a vital concept in the development of religious and legal authority, spurned on by the Umayyads' failure to unite the Caliphate and present themselves as worthy arbiters of the Quran and its laws. It's at this point, therefore, that the Umayyads' time in leadership was beginning to draw to a close. The warning signs, however, weren't entirely obvious to the new caliphate. The ambitious building continued under El Walid I and beyond, only stopping briefly from 717 to 724, under the reign of the more austere Umar II. This surge in wealth, however, led to an apparent growth of decadence within the court that was beginning to attract serious criticism from religious scholars in this period. Even taking into account the fact that our sources are from the following caliphate, it is clear that the caliphal lifestyle was starting to be seen as unsustainable. Coupled with the way that Umayyad governors tended to isolate the people they ruled over, and the growth of hadith as a preferred way to interpret Islamic law to caliphal decretals, this resulted in a serious hemorrhaging of the Umayyad dynasty's legitimacy. El Walid II, caliph from 743 to 744, is singled out especially for his lavish consumption of luxury goods and raucous banquets by our sources, and was in fact usurped by his brother Yazid III, who promised upon becoming caliph that he would return the office to the righteous path, promising concessions such as allowing governors to collect and keep their own taxes. By this time, however, the caliphate had lost a great deal of respect amongst the people, and despite his promises, Yazid failed to make any substantial changes to the way that things were run. This is exacerbated by the fact that, by the 720s, conquest had dried up significantly. As you'll recall from earlier in the episode, part of Mu'awiyah's issues at the start of the dynasty's reign was the slowing of conquests, which provoked restlessness amongst the armies of the caliphate without the release valve of new lands to fight against. History was about to repeat itself in dramatic fashion. Furthermore, in conquering parts of Central Asia, the Umayyads discovered the perennial and ever-present issue of empire building in this part of the world, raids by steppe-dwelling nomads. The new cities of the Islamic world were being attacked sporadically by groups of Turkic and Khazar raiders, causing serious issues along the border states. You may remember from our first episode, the way that Sasanian Persia faced a similar issue prior to the rise of Islam. And it's worth noting that every power in this period struggled with Turkic and Mongol raiding bands right up until the 18th century. This was compounded by the fact that from 740 to 743, the Berbers of Northern Africa rebelled too, cutting off this region from the Caliphate. Although the Khalif Hisham II was able to deal with this, it weakened Syria's military base. Furthermore, Iraq and Egypt were becoming quickly resentful that money was flowing out of them and towards Syria, and the army at the time was starting to be made of exclusively Syrian tribes. It's worth remembering that one of Yazid III's failed promises is that he would let provinces rule and administer themselves. Then, in 744, Disaster struck. The Kalb and Qais tribes, just as they had done in the Second Fitna, fought between each other, and at the same time, Shia revolts broke out in Iraq. The spirit of rebellion stretched further east into Iran, 
where the dominant political factions there were waiting for the right time to march on Syria. One of these factions, since 710, had preached that the Umayyads were illegitimate rulers and needed to be overthrown. What is significant about this is that their leaders were descended from the Prophet's uncle Abbas, giving them a powerful claim to leadership over the Islamic world. In 750, this army marched from Khorasan in eastern Iran, taking Syria and Egypt at lightning speed. The Umayyads were forced to flee, and what remained of the family left to Al-Andalus, safely away from the new dynasty's power. By 754, their leader El-Mansur was proclaimed the new caliph, under the name of a dynasty known today as the Abbasids, named after the link to Abbas. By 762, Iraq had replaced Syria as the capital of the caliphate, and its central power rested in the newly constructed city of Baghdad, a huge ambitious building project that would remain the centre of Islamic power until the Mongol sacking in 1257. What followed would be a golden age for the Islamic world, where scholarship, trade and political confidence soared to new heights. The Umayyads, therefore, were certainly a fascinating dynasty, who oversaw the crystallization of Islamic power in the regions that they conquered. Under them, the political and legal structures of the Islamic world began to take shape, and the caliphate's boundaries were established. It is perhaps ironic, though, that the backlash against their controversial reign set down a large number of further presidents that would be equally, if not more, decisive in the shaping of the destiny of this part of the world in the Middle Ages. Whether you see them as self-obsessed political movers, or victims of poor press after their reign had been quashed, the Umayyads undeniably left their mark, and under them, the early empire began to settle as the seismic political force that shaped the world in both the Middle Ages and through to the modern day. In our next episode, we will examine the Abbasid Caliphate, one of the most successful, although fraught, periods in Islamic history. We will look at the golden age of science, scholarship and debate that flourished under the funding of new cities, the new dynasty's ambitious trade and political policies, as well as the continuing disputes that erupted over the Khalif's legitimacy, especially as, in an unprecedented move, rival caliphates began to emerge to challenge Baghdad's supremacy. Thank you very much for listening to Islam in the Middle Ages, and see you in the next episode.